so that you can get to the proper piece. Of it. And they said, well, it's, you know, it's proprietary. So it's a system that we have that the, the, the 988 call taker feeds in all the data that they have and it spits out a piece of that they send it to. So can I look at it? Can I see it? Not again. So we're, we're trying to take over that process, to be honest with you. We're trying to take over call routing. Um, I don't know if, if I'm supposed to say that or not, but if the legislation passes in August, if the legislation passes in August and OES is deemed responsible for this network and for this call handling for 988, then we will start to implement our own, just like we do for 911 for the state of California, we'll, we'll try to implement our own routing and our own sort of uh, control over it. So that way we can have a little bit more of effective back and forth between, between the two entities. I think Dale has a question on board. Oh no, sorry, Dale. You don't get to talk. <laughs> <laughs> What's up? That was a, it was a uh, old question for uh, Paul. I texted him. We're good. Carry on. Take care of him, Paul. Aaron, did you? So I assume, and I think I got this from you just now, you were deemed responsible at the very beginning. Is that correct? Is, this, is the state offices contacted and said, we want to create 988? And... No, 988 is a federal initiative. So, so 988 was already in motion, okay. already, already being done. Somebody said, oh, yes, you do 911. This is pretty close. So why don't you go ahead and take care of the technology as well? That's because uh, one of the questions she had, yeah, why are we even involved? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Like yeah. those people were transferring the calls to us when they needed us regardless. It's just a It's a lot of the same thing. No, it, I exactly. Think that's where all the confusion is coming from. And I, like, especially for us, we had uh, our crisis intervention team. <laughs> kind of blow it out of proportion. And yeah. Like, you need to change your policy. And this is what we do. And I'm sitting here going, sitting back going, no, we don't. Like, those people were still transferring the calls to us when they, when they needed us before. So, yeah. it doesn't I mean, change. It, nothing changed. Cool. I think our agency has kind of taken a little step back. I think we've I, I tried to school them a little bit. Like, there's, we're not changing the way we're doing anything. That's why I was really hesitant to send anything out to the dispatchers at yeah. all. Yeah. Because same thing, same it's process. Same thing, just in case you hear. Yeah. And now I'm seeing memes or photos or whatever all over yeah. social media. Because it's live. Yeah. Saying it's live and it's replacing. They're using the word replace. And that's what bothers me. It's not a replacement. You can still call the 1 800 number. Yeah. It's not a replacement. Yeah. So I don't. I, when I see these, you know, memes it's the or same thing. on Facebook, I'm like, no, I yeah. want to school my friends and be like, no, no yeah. it's not. Same it's as like, it's always been. Yeah. 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 Well, to kind, of, to kind of expand on that, open it up, the big shift that's going to come when, when the state tells us at 911 to transfer. That's, that's what we're That's been a big one. Yeah. <clears throat> You're absolutely right. With, with you all no. say, no, 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 not me, not me. Okay. <laughs> the, the, the state thing, the, <laughs> so right now, there's legislation that's, that's passing through rapidly. That yeah. It's almost at a federal level, the state's trying to catch up and everybody's trying to get there together. And what, what's going to impact us is when they tell us this call meets this criteria, you know, right. forget all that stuff about, you know, send the cops, send the cops, send the fire. You're going to transfer that to 988. In today's world, 988 can't handle that. They're not set up. They, we will bombard them. So um, it's interesting. And that's where the big, and, and we'll talk mm -hmm. about this more at the, the round table after lunch, but yeah. there's, a, there's a huge gap in what they can handle. And what we're going to send them. Yeah, especially depending on how the laws are, right? I mean, there that could potentially be a lot of calls. Oh, every fifty-one fifty, I'm excited. I'm gonna ship them like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to talk to me anymore, <laughs> right? <laughs> that was mainly my comment. That, that, that would be like, yeah. But I'm assuming the legislation is on the rise is purely about technology and purely about. This is where you send the call. No, there won't be. No. Is there, is there anything about the follow up once you receive the call? We'll get your email. We'll send it to you. The stuff is on the board. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, mostly it's it's technology focused, right? It, right. It, it sets up, you know, a funding standard. It sets up that sort of thing. Um, the the policy, the win, and the how, or the win of the transfer is is really still going to be primarily locally determined, right? They will say. It'll 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 literally say nine one one shall transfer to nine eight eight, and that's all it's going to say. So what does that mean, right? And that that tells you the that tells you the the what, but it doesn't tell you anything else. So you guys are we're going to transfer to them, and then they're going to transfer back to us, back to school. Right. So whatever policies you have today, 
for transferring to that 1-800 number will, will probably be your, your initial policy if it has to expand in the future. Some, some LAPD has a pretty, pretty robust LAPD program. Well, that's that's because because they 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 I know, it would be Hirsch, I know. Yeah, that's a whole. They call it 911 diversion. So. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I think that what's going to happen is for agencies like that that already have some sort of mental health, you know, partnership with with Dee Hirsch or whomever, that will probably stay in place for at least the near future. Dee Hirsch is one of those 13 centers that's going to be a 988, you know, call center for agencies that don't have those relationships or don't have those resources already established. It's going to be a, a transfer off to that agency and that's going to be that now there is expectation in the legislation of in the in the future mobile crisis teams response teams and all that but that's all on the 988 side that's all on these 13 centers to figure that out right to get the funding for it and all that that is not PSAP responsibility or PSAP centric uh you know part of the legisl legislation so it is there is a piece there that is heavy duty and that's where everyone gets confused and that's what's all over the internet is that oh yeah you're gonna have somebody who can come out to your house and help you talk you through this crisis you're having that ain't happening for a while you know yeah and in, 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 in oh, sorry how many uh how many officers are cip trained most of them are, most of them are. so any responding officer I realize you're, you'd be better not to kill someone who's mentally ill and barricaded. You don't want to kill them to try to figure out their thing, right? Correct. How about this for a suit? On CIT, what's your goal to be yeah, in the CIT? Yeah, I have to work the band now. We have pretty much had a mistake. But to Caitlin's point, it doesn't really change the thing that they're the top. So, you don't have to talk about that. So, well, I, I, yeah, right. So, but, but there's, so there's nobody else yeah. right now. Is the is the ugly truth? I, I full disclosure. Yeah. I'm vice president of NAMI, National Alliance on Mental Illness, and all we want you to do is take on your side work. And I know you don't want to, because it's going to tie you up for the rest of the night. That's what we want. So that's we're pushing legislation that way, nationally. You just don't please, want to be, you just don't want to be in a barricaded subject. Yeah. Okay. You're, you're, I know. you're barricaded someone for four hours and you're tying up all the resources of the city that I you don't want. And it sounds cold, and I don't mean it to it's sound like, cold. But it's it's the truth of the matter is it's now you have all yeah. these people that don't Out what you want to do with it. Yeah, it's an unfunded mandate to the states. So we're working through it. Uh, we've talked to all 13 call, crisis call centers. They're working on personnel, staffing up to make sure they could accommodate all of Tim's transfers. But we'll see how that goes. Yeah, so here's what I've been pushing to the 988 community because I've been talking to them a lot lately. Because they're, you know, they're they're worried about this, you know, this clash of, of you know, personalities or operational considerations. I'm telling them PSAPs are happy to do this because too many calls coming in right now. Too many calls are understaffed or overworked. Just, yeah, if, if there's a plan in place, everybody's happy to do this. The, the, op, the you know, the key word there is a plan. Everybody wants to make sure that this is a, a smooth transition and that there's something there that we can grab onto. Um, you know, the questions that I'm getting, what about cities or counties that already have an operation list, that already have, you know, local mental health crises response teams? What are we doing with those? Is this supposed to supersede that? So these are a lot of questions that we're trying to answer right now, but until the legislation is passed, it's really we're in kind of a gray area right now. Um, you know, even on the even on the technology side right now, oh yes, we're doing a lot of this work. We were given some money from General Fund to get started on it to make sure they had the tech, the technology to transfer. It's ten digit, whatever. So we 
even we don't have any any statutory authority to do anything right now. We're just we're we're doing this work in anticipation of the law passing. So we're getting a lot of questions. Uh, you know, we're talking to the Lifeline Centers. We're asking them, are you staffed appropriately? Do you do you realize the the influx of calls that are coming not only from the peace apps once we start transferring, but just public knowledge, 98, just the fact that it's all over the news, it's all over social media, and you're going to get blown up with calls. They seem to understand that, um, but really our concern right here is transfers in the PSAP community. If you've got, you know, your, your call takers on the line and they're transferring a call because they have to, to 988, and they're sitting there because remember, in California, only 90% of those calls get answered, period. You're sitting there and that phone's ringing for two minutes, three minutes, five minutes. That's a problem, right? Because now you've tied up your resource and, and you're mandated to transfer. So we're trying to make sure that these 98 centers understand that not only do you need to be staffed appropriately, but we want to get you the technology so that you have priority lines, right? So that when the phone rings and it's from Riverside Sheriff, you pick a, you know, you have to have dedicated personnel to pick up that line. Line sure transfer. transfer. <laughs> and Andrew, on that, that is one of the things that uh, Tim and I, and like I said, NAFTA County Boards, and that's some of these legislators, that's one of the things that we were very adamant. If we're transferring, we can't sit on these lines for yeah. three, five, ten minutes. Huh. Is it going to be okay as long as we transfer to the 988 that we, once we hear it ringing, we disconnect, kind of like we do on some of the calls we have now? They're not sure about how that's going to work yet. So that's some of the liability that we're worried about with this time. We can show through ECAS that we transferred the number. Is that going to be good enough? Yeah. Yeah. So these are, I mean, these are big questions that we're trying to work through right now. And, and you know, for those of you who worked with OES, you understand we don't we don't tell you how to do your business. We just try to get you the tools to do it. So a lot of it is going to be decided at the local level with that legislation kind of as the backdrop. So, I mean, I was just at uh, uh, the National NINA conference in Louisville, and I was talking to State of Minnesota, and they are in way deeper shit than we are because <laughs> they have a law on the books already that says that it is illegal to send an armed response to a 5150 call if there's no like weapon there's like two 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 little little caveats in there and uh so they've started sending mobile crisis teams because they had funding set up for it however the responders in these mobile crisis teams have realized very quickly that they don't want to go into these situations without an officer accompanying them because it's dangerous which it's illegal to do. So they are they are hurting right now. So luckily we're not there yet, but who knows. All right, so I, I mentioned this briefly, uh, you know, technology limitations are severe right now. With this area code routing, I mean, we've got we got real problems on our hands as far as, you know, transferring back and forth. And that's, you know, that's the concern that we have is what do we do about these edge cases, these, these whatever, two, 3%, that doesn't matter. I mean, it's, it's, it's a number of calls that are gonna come through that are gonna be, you know, they're gonna be routed on area code, somebody with a 213 area code that's sitting in Boston. It, it's, it's, it's a problem. So we are, um, we're working on this, you know, at OES, just, just trying to make sure that the 988 centers understand exactly what it is they're dealing with. They seem to all pretty well understand how the calls are routed to them. Again, it doesn't matter today, and it doesn't matter to 99% of the calls because it's just somebody looking for a, a voice to talk to or whatever, but you know, being the Office of Emergency Services, we're worried about those emergency cases. And so, you know, um, <clears throat> if we get statutory control over the network and over call handling and all the good stuff that we do for 911, we think we have a good opportunity to get this fixed and get this routed, these calls routed properly, at least inside of California. Uh, if not, that doesn't happen if Vibrant uh, continues to the, the marks that they're on at the federal level, because they do have their their, their hooks in pretty deep at the federal level, uh, then we may, we, we may not be successful there. So more to come on that. Uh, that legislation is still going, into, you know, finding its way through. But I think they're uh, supposed to meet and meet and debate on it August 1st. I think August 1st is supposed to hit the wire. So there could be a vote. I think mean, there has to be a vote between August 1st and August 25th, I think is the end of session, something 23rd, 25th. Uh, if they don't vote on it, if the legislature punts it, then it actually it dies because it was supposed to go last year, got extended to this year. And every bill gets a two-year life cycle until it dies, then it has to be reintroduced for all that. So uh, we'll see what happens, but it'll happen very, very soon. I think it's the 26th. It's the last day of the cycle. 26th this year? I think, I think that's what it is. 
All right, so until that's solved, I mean, the, the technology at the Lifeline centers, they're just gonna to need to be able to ingest uh, 10 digit transfers. We're, we are trying, like I said before, to get them racks and circuits through our next gen core service providers. They're not gonna be ingested into the 911 network. They're gonna be adjacent to it, but we wanna have that same, you know, that same level of uh, redundancy and availability so that they can, they, they can uh, get calls from you and they can send calls to you uh, when necessary. Uh, we'll work with them to make sure that they're you know, their their uh, systems are programmed properly to make sure that those calls get to today. Uh, there's a huge disparity between the centers. D. Hirsch down in LA is state of the art. It's all nice. And they've got you know some pretty cool equipment that they that they run on, uh, including like priority lines for LAPD and LA Fire. Uh, but then we went to Yellow County up north. And it's just just telephones on a desk. It's nothing. So we've got a lot of ground to cover for a lot of these centers. So we're kind of working through that right now. We'll get that solved pretty soon. Uh, so we already kind of covered this a little bit, so I'll kind of breeze through it, but policy at the local level is very important. That's going to determine where we go with this. I mean, you folks at the city county level are really going to be the ones to uh, to write your own policy to determine when and how you transfer. We want to give you the capability to transfer, and we want to give them the ability to adjust those, but you're going to decide when that happens. Uh, I mentioned earlier the Policy Academy Working Group that was set up at the federal level. I, was, uh, I participated in that. We are working on uh, presenting some uh, I guess like a decision tree, like a, like a matrix, like when you should transfer, when you shouldn't, uh, that we can give to PSAPs who may not have that in place already and, and allow them to use that as a baseline. Generally, we don't do that. Like I said, we don't tell PSAPs when, when and how to do their job, but we felt like this was something that we could at least just get this ball rolling and help out. So we're working on that. We're actually going to bring that to the next task force meeting. So Tim, you'll get some input on that and help us sharpen that up to make sure it's something workable. But standard operating procedure at the local level is going to be our, you know, it's going to decide what we do here. So you guys will, uh, you know, you'll, you'll write your own policies. Your city will tell you what, or your county will tell you what you have to do for transfer. So, But the bigger piece, and this is probably where an agency like APCO International comes into play, is we need legislation. We need, we need federal legislation on this. We need some, some help pushing some things. Uh, the FCC met and conferred on location for 988 calls, providing location, mandating the carriers provide location. Uh, they decided that it was really difficult, you know, it was a complex issue, so they punted. They didn't decide on, they didn't, they didn't decide to mandate it, essentially. So they're going to convene another group, another task force or working group to, to take a deeper look to see if the FCC can mandate it. The only federal agency that can, that can really push the carriers into any one direction. Short of that, that's gonna be, I mean, that's gonna be, we we think that's the, the, the premier issue in this in this in this conversation is getting location for these calls, especially as it relates to nine one one. Obviously, that's our you know that's our main concern. So FCC is going to keep talking you know through that. Uh, we would hope that agencies like APCO and Nina and, and everyone else is is putting pressure on the FCC to make sure that le that that legislation gets written up or that those rulings get written up so we can get location on these calls. Uh, we would like to see some sort of federal legislation drafted. I don't know if that you know, it might be a pipe dream. Maybe we'll just have to settle for state. Uh, but something to address that liability issue for 911 PSAPs. One of the common things that I hear in the field is if I've got a call and I transfer it off to 988 and that person dies, is my PSAP held liable? You know, it came into us as a 911 call. Who's, who's liable for that, for, that, for that death? And, you know, that's something that that I, you know, we at the 911 office feel that, that that legislation at the state level should provide coverage for the PSAP personnel in, the, in those instances, right? For best effort, kind of, you know, we follow the policy, the transfer is called, person died, not our fault kind of thing. So that, that's something that we really want to get into. And then uh, state legislation on, on fee collection technology, we're working on that right now, that August 1st through August 26th timeframe I gave you guys in the legislation that's pending, that has, a, a fee collection service. It's exactly the same as Setna. What we pay for 911 today. Uh, it's the same exact model. We just ported it over to 988 so that OES would be able to provide them with the technology they need. There's a future consideration in there for those mobile crisis teams for some sort of, you know, there's going to be some sort of rudimentary dispatch. Um, I don't know if radio is really going to come into play. I know that uh, LA Fire Department, when they partnered with D.D. Hearst, they they wanted them to get radios, you know, when they started sending out mobile units. So that may be a piece of it. 
but we're working on that. Uh, the fund will be considerably lower with only 13 centers. Uh, we think that it's going to be a few cents a month for everyone for a 980B on your phone call. So it would be similar to the 911C. But that's just technology. That's just network call handling. That has nothing to do with staffing. That has nothing to do with uh, policy, with uh, you know, with lobbying, anything like that. This is just going to be kind of a, a technology fee so that we can make sure that the network's in place and everything is, is, is ready for them to transfer those calls or for you to transfer those calls. Uh, they still have to work on their own staff and we have to make sure these, these 13 lifeline centers have to make sure that they're prepared to answer those calls. And we've talked to them. Some of them seem like they're they're working on that. They're working on federal grants. They're, you know, they're getting their money through insurance companies through however they can with partnerships in the, in the, in the mental health world to get that done. So that's it. Anything else on 988? All right, good discussion. Thanks everybody, appreciate it. Uh... We do have a couple of questions. Oh, we have questions on. online? Uh, oh, online. Uh, field a couple questions. Paul, take this. Yeah, Dale, Dale, just text me, Dale. <laughs> How did you know? How did you know? <laughs> we, just, <laughs> we just assumed it was you, Dale. Dale, a problem shop. <laughs> um, there was one question from John Henry at San Luis Obispo County. It says, is the OE, Cal OES website going to get fixed? Search is broken and all existing links are 404s. Uh, just yeah. open and take it with IT. <laughs> so, so to answer that specific question, um, our IT department, again, I want to back up. Anybody in here IT specific? I'm sorry, I apologize now. Um, our OES IT is updating our website this morning and it's all broken. Everything. I was chatting with my team on the way down here this morning. It's all messed up. Our team relies on all the data from our website. So pretty much my team's on holiday. So we, we understand it and they're following up with IT internally. Okay. Could you? I just give you the access to the Give me a challenge. Back when, back when, back earlier about 11, we were talking about uh, getting checks sent and then uh, Lisa Barr said that uh, we never really know if it, if it gets accepted when they file for it. Uh, there's no notification that a check has been sent. So it's just probably a very well, accepted. Okay, specific to the annual training allotment reimbursement. So that's something that I can work with my team. When the forms have been processed and accepted, we'll do some sort of outreach message. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. You were just asking for a lot today. I need you. You're, you're at about a nine. I need you down here about a four. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll take that as an answer. Okay. Does anybody else online have any questions? Just unmute. You do. Yeah, it's Dale. Of course, I do. Um, <laughs> Andrew, when you when you said the uh, um, nine eight eight services were were potentially looking at being adjacent to nine one. Are they are they physically going to be running on the next gen core and separated by like a VLAN sort of thing, or is it just conceptually they're going to be parallel? Uh, right now, conceptually, Dale. Uh, you know, until OES gets some sort of statutory uh, you know responsibility for routing those calls, it's just basically going to be um, you know us providing the network redundancy and resiliency, right? The the, the circuits that Paul was talking about, the racks into their call center and the call handling, but the network itself, if we don't get control over the network, then we won't, there, it won't be actually, you know, 911 network. It won't be connected. It won't be through our core. If we okay. But if you, if you do, you would basically place it on the core. We could, yeah, we could partition the core and put it and run everything through there very easily. Yeah. And we would. And then with, with, uh, with, with a push to, unmask their the, the caller's location and, and data um, to these call centers are, are is there pushback from them will the 10 digit number still be anonymous for people who want to remain anonymous or is it potentially going to cut down their call volume by people being chilled from calling in so that's a good question we actually we were concerned about that early on right i mean the anonymous nature of a of a caller with suicidal ideation can be pretty important right they don't want to some of them don't want to Give you their name or location they just want to talk so we thought that that might be a, a big consideration but in talking to the call centers 
the people answering the calls and running the calls, they don't, none of them are really pushing back on that. Um, everyone seems to think that it's, that it's perfectly fine. Now we've had conversations around that. What does that, what does that look like? What does that mean? If, if your location comes with that call on every call, then yeah, you may have a, you may have an, uh, kind of a backlash, right? For 98, they may not get the, get as many calls as they would if they, if you, if you feel like you're not anonymous, that could be a problem. And so, um, one of the things we've talked about is using, you know, our technology to, to sort of solve that, uh, cause we would have the ability in California, uh, with the next gen core that we've stood up and the call handling that we're putting out there, we would have the ability to essentially, um, I wouldn't call it strip that data off the call, but if the call came in with location to the 988 center, uh, to have it sort of, uh, redacted, I guess, for a better word or, or suppressed. And in the case that the call would need to be sent to 911, then they could send it over and location would still be there with the call. It's just that the 988 center didn't get it, but the 911 center would essentially just set up, uh, I don't know, permissions for lack of a better word, uh, to make sure that that location is, is there for the 911 call taker. That's something we've been talking about. Now, if, okay. the, and then, if the FCC doesn't comply, uh, or doesn't comply, FCC <laughs> comply. Uh, if the FCC doesn't help us out and doesn't doesn't rule on this, then we've got a we've got a whole different set of problems on our hands that we have to try and figure out. So we're working through that right now. Uh, but bottom line is, if if they don't provide look or if they don't mandate location be sent on the call, we can use something like you know Rapid SOS, Rapid Deploy, to to, to get location for that caller. Uh, but that's only going to work in the case of wireless. You're not going to get that for for VoIP or for wireline. But it would certainly help in you know 80, 90 percent of the of the instances of the calls that you're getting. Would the would the ten digit number still be anonymous for them, or or not? Um, today they they get the number of the caller. They get the ten digit number of the caller. I believe. So and, okay. Yeah, I don't I don't think that that would remain anonymous because I don't think it is today. I think they don't get any obviously any any, uh, any Annie, they don't get any, I mean, any alley, they don't get location, but they think they get number today, if I'm not mistaken, Paul. Yeah, I, think, I think they do. Yeah, so I think they get number today, Dale, so I think that that would continue. Okay. Yeah. Anybody so else can... online for the question? I see Keith from Rapid SOS is on. Yeah, Andrew um, and Paul, before I ask my question, um, I just want to say publicly, I was going to send you an email, but I'm going to do it here publicly and to say this is one of the best, most informative interactive presentations I've seen from Cal OES. And I'm just so grateful for what the two of you contributed today. So thank you for that. Can we get that? Um, <laughs> to my boss. I'll, you know what? I'll send the email and I'll CC Budge. How's that? So my question, forgive me, it's, it's born in ignorance, or maybe you covered it and I missed it, but is there such a thing at this point or on the roadmap around text to 988? Yes. So text to 988, is, is, it works today. It already exists. Um, okay. There's in two different forms. Uh, so depending on where you are. So there's crisis text line. For any of you who have heard of that, it's uh, 741741. It's on the back of the, uh, every university ID card for every student, it's on the back, crisis, you know, crisis text line. It's, it's a pretty, pretty big operation. They're nationwide. So they're handling the bulk of text for 988 for California today and will be for the foreseeable future. But uh, my understanding is that legislation will, just like 911 legislation will say 988 traffic. So that will apply text and calls. And today there's some sort of chat feature that they run through Vibrant 2. Uh, it's a little bit of a mess, but uh, I understand that that will be part of it too going forward. Now, I don't know what the chat's going to look like if Vibrant is no longer in the picture. If we end up, you know, going a separate direction from them, I don't know what what will happen there, but text and calling will certainly still be a, a key component. Now, that's great, Andrew. Thanks. Um, I've had chats with, this is just um, background, I've had chats with Crisis Text Line on several occasions, and, you know, their whole model is based on anonymity. Um, and they are really um, opposed, maybe a strong word, but I'll use it. They're really opposed to having location delivered with those because they could deter people from making that anonymous text. And that's, that's just crisis text line stance on that. And I understand it. Yeah. Yeah. Crisis text line. One of their biggest selling points is the anonymous nature of it. You just text back and forth. Exactly. Who yeah. just, you know, some, some comfort. So we've talked to them. We have, we have, 
uh, gosh, almost weekly meetings with Crisis Text Line right now. So we're working through that with them, Keith. So we'll we'll definitely be um, talking to them. Dave, they've talked about the possibility of becoming a 14th uh, Lifeline Center in California because they're already part of that network nationwide. They're just not uh, part of the California, you know, that 13 center uh, consortium that I was talking about. So they've talked about that. And if we can get them in, you know, I, you know too early to say, but perhaps there's a uh, an avenue to, to leave those texts anonymous. I'm not, not sure how we'll go on that one. If I, if you don't mind, I'll just add one more piece, which I think is interesting. Crisis text line is, they use area codes, right? Because they know the area code. And if they, if they understand that an emergency response is needed, they look at the area code and they randomly select a police department to call and beg for help. Yes, they have no, say, yeah, getting to. Yeah. And mo a lot of PSAPs just reject it and say, we don't know why you're calling us. There's nothing we can do to help. And, um, you know, I've tried to share that with agencies. It's like, just please give them, first of all, understand that they exist. They're real. When they're asking for help, they mean it. And please don't reject those calls. Give them, you know, all the help you can to find that person who's in crisis. Yeah. Thanks. Be, that's going to be a long road, Keith. But yeah, I definitely understand. Yeah. We've heard that one before. So, yeah. Thanks, Andrew. All right. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right. <laughs>